Hello, this is Mike Evans, and I want to welcome you to a brand new series entitled Finding God in the Plague. Today's message is, did God send the plague? This is a question I've heard probably a hundred times from different people asking that question. Did he send this plague? Why, how come this plague came? And they want answers. I'm not going to give you any answers from my personal opinion, that's completely irrelevant. And everyone else's opinion is irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant is what the Word of God says. So let's do this. Let's get into the Word of God and see what the Word of God says about plagues. Number one, Jesus. Here's the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. You know all about that. And the Last Supper was a commemoration of a plague, yes, over Egypt. And it was also a commemoration of another plague, the plague of the death of Christ and the suffering of Christ. It was all predicted in the Last Supper and even out of one of the Psalms. And, of course, the revelation of the Passover plague was the angel of death had to be stopped only by the blood of the Lamb. Many say plagues are Old Testament matters, that we're New Testament believers, and there's no such thing as plagues today. God doesn't send plagues today. We're under grace. Now, let's look at what the scriptures say. I want you to see right now three scriptures in the Old Testament. For at this time, I will send all my plagues to your very heart and on your servants and on your people, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Exodus 9, 14. But while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was aroused against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. Numbers 11, 33. If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sickness. Deuteronomy 28, 58 through 59. Did you see that? Did you see the scripture that said, when the meat was between their teeth. And he also said that the plagues would not only come on them, would come on their descendants. These are the last words of Moses before Joshua led the children of Israel, God's people, into the promised land. He's talking to him about the covenant people, the people of promise, but he's warning him that even though they're going into the promised land, if they get their eyes off of God and put any idols between them and God, here's what's going to happen in Deuteronomy 28, 61. He says, Also, every sickness, every plague, which is not written in the book of the law, will the Lord bring upon you until you are destroyed. The Lord will bring upon you all the diseases and plagues. Again, the Lord is talking to his covenant people. Can you imagine that? I won't see this for one second. Joshua is fixing to take the land. This is the Joshua in Jericho with the walls going down, being warned of the man of God that plagues will come upon you if you disobey, and the Lord will send those plagues. In 1 Samuel 5, 7, the Ark of the Covenant had been taken into the land of the Philistines. And God sends a plague so great that the idol fell on its face. What what an illustration. It says, when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, The Ark of God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh towards us. And Dagon, our God. Yeah. It's a great example between what happens when the church makes a covenant with the world. 
I want you to see these two scriptures. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. 2 Samuel 24, 25. Behold, the Lord will strike your people with a serious affliction, your children, your wives, and all your possessions. 2 Chronicles 21, 14. Did you see that? Did you see the first one? The plague was stayed by David's obedience to the Lord. Plagues are a sign of God's wrath, usually they're re regarding idolatry. Now, for all the preachers who say, oh yes, that's Old Testament, but I'm, I'm in the New Testament of God's grace, and we don't have to go there. And so they give you smooth words of comfort while people are dying in plagues and are suffering in plagues. We're going to debunk that myth now. Here's Jesus. He turns to a blind man he healed in John 5, 14, and he tells him, See, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Do you hear that? Lest a worse thing come upon you. We also read in Acts chapter 5 a story of two amazing church members, Ananias and Sapphira. They weren't tithers. They weren't double tithers. They weren't triple tithers. They showed up with 100%, they said, that they gave to God. They must have been pillars in the assemblies. But the word of the Lord was, you've lied to the Holy Ghost, and both of them were struck dead. Let's go further in the New Testament and look at a book called Revelation or the Apocalypse. By the way, apocalypse in Greek means unveiling. And let's, for one second, let me mention something to you. You're talking about right now in a plague. We're in the midst of a plague. There's going to be plagues in the future. If you read the book of Revelation, you'll see that. Revelation 9, 18. God sends a plague and a third of all mankind is wiped out. Revelation 9, 20. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hand, that they should worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. They will, would not repent. They hardened their hearts despite the plague. I want to say something right now. This is precisely what David Wilkerson told me in 1986, that there is idolatry in the church, and there was unrepentance, a lack of repentance, and a plague was coming because of it. In Revelation eleven six, the two witnesses appear in Jerusalem and preach on the last days. These have power to shut up heaven so there's no rain, the prophecy says. They have power over, over the water to turn it into blood, to strike the earth with plagues as often as they desire. These men have the power to strike the world with plagues from God, just as Moses predicted to Joshua. I want you to see these astonishing three scriptures. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. Revelation 15, 1. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Revelation 15, six through eight. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, 
Come out of her, my people, that ye may not be partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18, 4. Now think of what was just said. In verse 8, he describes the plagues taking place in a single day. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. The plagues continue to be mentioned. Even the, in the final two chapters of the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, that describes the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation 21.9 mentions seven angels with the last seven plagues. If you look at that particular scripture, then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls filled with seven plagues came to me and talked with me saying, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Do you hear that? I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. You know what that's talking about. That's talking about the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's talking about our savior. And where did he come out of? When did he come? In the midst of a plague. God cleanses through plagues. Plague, listen, don't take it lightly. Plagues are the judgment of God. Plagues are sent to get people to repent. And we've got to humble ourselves. And we've got to look at this thing from the word of God. My opinion doesn't matter. No, your pastor's doesn't matter. Only the word of God's opinion matters. Let's go to the last words of the book of Revelation. Last words are very important. Very important. Revelation twenty two eighteen. Listen to this. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. The Bible even ends with a warning. Not to change God's word. Those who do will experience plagues. I want to say something, Pastor. You're looking at that, so well, I, didn't, I didn't take a word out and put a word. Yes, you did. You're taking the word of God and you're adding stuff to it or removing stuff from it. You're not preaching against sin. Do you know the moral standard of the world is determined by the moral standard in the church? When you refuse to preach against sin and there's no conviction in the pews, you are taking away from the word of God. It's true. When you refuse to preach against hell, you're taken away from the word of God. And when you're adding stuff about cheap grace, an exemption from judgment, you are putting yourselves in a position to bring the plagues of God on your own head. Yes, plagues are from God. The plague that's here now was sent by God and there'll be plagues in the future. So why are we experiencing plagues? What is the number one reason this plague has come upon humanity? Because humanity shook its fist in the face of God and embraced secular humanism, not only in the world, but also in the church, where man meets your needs, where your focus is on man, not on the Lord. But the Bible says the fear of the Lord leads to life, Proverbs 18, 23. The Hebrew word for fear is awe of the exalted an overwhelming sense of his glory. The fear of God also implies the hatred of evil and wrong. You don't hear preaching against sin today. Why? Because of religious, secular humanism. The gospel is being radically influenced in the church by a secular humanistic world. They say, well, well we, look at how big our church is. Look at how prosperous our church is. Tell it to the first church of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Secular humanism puts man on the throne. It does not mind man worshiping God or claiming to know God as long as he's on the throne. Secular humanism promotes tolerance for immoral behavior. Secular humanism rejects absolute moral standards. You won't get convicted in a seeker-friendly church. You won't come into that church crying in repentance and falling on your face because they're taken away from the Word of God or they're adding to it. You can be sure of one thing. When the Antichrist takes control of this planet, he'll take control of religion and Christianity because the spirit of the Antichrist is in many of the churches today. How will he do that? He'll do it because the road has already been paved by seeker-friendly gospel preachers that will not preach on hell, will not preach on sin, and are comfortable, comfortable. Many are familiar with the words of Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, but few aren't familiar with the 13th through 15th verse. When I shut up heavens and there is no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land, or I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Stop right here. Look at me. He's calling his people wicked and having wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I'll heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to their prayers in this place. First, God sends plagues to humble us. Solomon affirms what we've studied throughout the Bible. God uses droughts and locusts and sickness and plagues to humble us, to help us realize we're not in control. He shuts up the skies. Instead of feasting, we're living in fear. Andrew Murray wrote, Pride must die in you, or nothing of heaven can live in you. I want to say it one more time. Pride must die in you, or nothing of heaven can live in you. Religious pride must die in you and me, or nothing can, of heaven can live in us. Secondly, the response to the plague is prayer and repentance. When we humble ourselves, it's a call to holiness. Neil Moody once said, it is a great deal better to live a holy life than to talk about it. We are told to let our light shine. And if it does, we won't need to tell anybody it does. The light will be our witness, our own witness. Lighthouses don't ring bells and fire cannons to call attention to their shining. They just shine. 1 Peter 1.16 says, Be holy! For I am holy. Peter's referring to what God said in the Torah, the four books of the law in Leviticus. Holiness comes at a cost. The cost is repentance and prayer and humility. Leonard Ravenhill noted, the world has lost the power to blush over its vice. The church has lost her power to weep over it. When is the last time you really repented before the Lord? When was the last time you cried out to God in forgiveness and you saw yourself the way he sees you? In Luke 18, 10 through 14, Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of that time. And he said to them, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed, thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I'm not unjust or an adulterer or a tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes. And the tax collector standing afar off 
would not so much as raise his eyebrows to heaven, but he beat his breath, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, this man went down to the, his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Yes, we have a problem right now in Christianity. It's called celebrities. You got Christians who really believe it. They're a celebrity. They believe it so strongly they've got, they got to have a jet to fly in. They got to have bodyguards. They, they, they believe that. They are a celebrity. But there are no celebrities at the foot of the cross. There are no celebrities in the presence of a holy God except Jesus, the Lamb of God. Our problem is we tend to identify more with the Pharisee than the tax collector. Religion does that to us. We are to be more like the tax collector, admitting our sins, humbling ourselves, crying out to God. If you can't cry out to God in the midst of the plague, your heart is as hard as stone. Hard as stone. Third, plagues pass when we respond to God's judgment. God does not send endless plagues with the desire to destroy us. He sends plagues with the desire to restore us. Look at all the positive aspects that follow a prayerful, repentant heart in the midst of a plague. I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. My eyes will be open. My ears will be attentive to their, their prayer in, the, in this place, the Lord says. When we pray and repent, God hears and responds. You want the plague to pass? There's a path to ending the plague. In Nehemiah 9, 2 and 3, the people of God had returned to Jerusalem after 70 years of bondage. Yet they had disobeyed the Lord by marrying people who did not follow their God. When called to repent, they did. Then those who repented separated themselves and confessed their sins and their iniquities. They stood up in the place and read the word of the Lord. And the Bible says they repented and confessed and worshiped the Lord. They obeyed. They didn't continue in sin. They separated themselves from their sinful ways. If we want the plague to pass, we must truly change from our sins and do what is right. They confessed. They both did what was right and confessed what was wrong. Sometimes we try to change the past without confessing. But in this case, the people publicly announced their wrongdoings. What was the last time you heard sinners crying out from their seats in repentance? Or your pastor crying out from the pulpit in repentance? The word says that we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of those sins. A sign of authentic confession is true brokenness. In the classic book, The Calvary Road, the words are spoken. This is ever the nature of true confession of sin, true brokenness. It is the confession that my sin is not just a mistake, a slip, or something which is really foreign to my heart. Not really like me to have such thoughts, do such things. But it is something which reveals the real I that shows me to be proud, rotten, unclean. Such things God says that I am. Revealing to me, revealing to me my true self. David confessed his sins. He humbled himself and he was a king. He wasn't trying to justify himself by gathering people around him to tell him how wonderful he was, how great he was. He wasn't doing that. He humbled himself in the presence of God in Psalm 50, 51.4. The second thing that happened in the midst of a plague is they listened. I love this thought. The people had gathered for a time of revival, listening to the word of God being read 
One fourth of the day, <laughs> not 20 minutes. That's, we're talking about at least three, four hours. They wanted to be in the Word. We have got more access to Bibles than any time in history because the Internet and Christian TV and Christian radio and all that stuff. But the truth is, the Word of God is not transforming our lives because we got one foot in the world and the other in the temple. It won't work. Another thing that happened out of a revelation of the plague is they worshipped. They concluded their time of repentance with worship. Do you realize a plague could end in praise? They worship one-fourth of the day. Now that's at least three hours. Maybe you need to stop watching TV or the news and start worshiping God. And, realize, and repenting and humbling yourself. There's something about singing our love to God that builds our faith in him. In James 5.13, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. If you don't know where to begin, turn to the middle of your Bible and find God's source of joy in the psalms. A plague brings us to our knees. It's not intended to leave us in despair. Through repentance, we can rejoice with our hands in the air. I want to say this. As I'm preaching to you, I'm seeing a fire. And I'm seeing a plague. And I'm seeing three Jews in the midst of a furnace that refuse to bend or bow or burn. And I'm seeing a king that says, there's a fourth man in the midst of the furnace. And he looks like the son of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, yes, he's coming in the midst of the plague. God sends plagues. He did in the past. He's doing it now. He'll do it in the future. But they're only to turn our hearts to him and pursue holiness. Today, we've forgotten what the word holiness means. We think it means happiness. On March 10, 1998, David Wilkerson preached a message entitled, The Dangers of the Gospel of Accommodation. He shared these words that stirred my heart as I sought the Lord in repentance during this corona crisis. Here's what he said. The gospel of Jesus Christ is one of self-denial. Jesus said, any man will come after me, let him deny himself, Take up his cross and follow me, Matthew 16, 24. Self-denial is not something you give. It's something you give up. The giving up of yourself, giving up everything you are. It's a living sacrifice to the Lord Jesus Christ to present your body a holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. God has every right to say to his church, if you expect to give me your body, your resurrected body, all through eternity, I have every right. It's only reasonable of me and reasonable service to ask your body why you're here on earth. I want every part of you surrender to me. We're not here for our own pleasure and prosperity. We're here for the pleasure of the king. When we want his attention, when we focus on him in the midst of the plague, his glory will come on us. A plague is painful, but it's also purposeful. Let us not forget the reason God sent his plagues upon the land. Let us respond with a heart of confession and repentance and holiness before the Lord and humility. Ladies and gentlemen, I realize this is a strong message. But it's not as strong as Jonathan Edwards' message, Sinners in the Hands of Angry God, that birthed a great awakening. God is calling me. God is calling you. God is calling all of us to get on our faces and acknowledge 
He sent the plague to get us to repent. If we will, if we'll hear from heaven, his glory is going to flow in a way you've never seen it. Hallelujah. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. All oh, will sing how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. All oh, will see how great. How great is our God. You're the name above all names. You're worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great. God. You're the name of all names. You are worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God, all oh, will see how great, how great is our God. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to How great. 